Hello friends, it's Labor Day weekend, and that's sort of the official end of summer. Some of you are watching on a last minute getaway weekend, good for you, and thanks for joining us. I'm filling in for John Kim, our online campus pastor today, I'm Tim Galley, and if you're new or newish to the online campus, know that he would love it if you said hi to John. You can email him at, at jkim at grace.org. And if you want to say hi to me, please email me at jkim at grace.org. No, I'm only kidding. Hey, if you need help finding a group or if I can help you grow in your journey of discipleship, please email me at tgalley at grace.org. I'd love to help you in any way I can. Next week is Campus Vision Sunday, and John will be doing something fun and special for this online Campus Vision. So we hope that you join us next week. But for today, this is Labor Day Sunday, we have a special guest speaker. And guess what? He's talking about work on Labor Day. That's right. We're grateful to have Matt Rustin. Matt serves as the executive director for Made to Flourish, which is an amazing organization committed to helping churches integrate faith, work, and economic wisdom for the flourishing of their communities. One of the things that they like to say is that we want to help close the gap from Sunday to Monday. A little bit about Matt. Matt received his Master's of Divinity from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and he has a Doctorate of Ministry in Faith, Work, and Economics and Vocation from Fuller Seminary. Uh, he has served in churches in North Dakota, Chicago area, Kansas City, and Madison. Uh, he and his wife, Margie, and their daughter, Olivia, and son, Owen, live in Kansas City, and we've invited them to spend the weekend here in Greater Boston. We're really grateful to have him and his family and we hope that this message helps you connect some dots between what you believe and what you do. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful that you are a God who is actively involved in our lives. And we pray, Lord, that you would just help us to understand more and more how things like our faith integrate with our work. We pray, Lord, that we'd bring this, that we'd be ambassadors of this incredible message that you've entrusted us with to all the places that we go, in our communities, in our homes, in our places of vocation and career. So Lord, help us to make sense of the things that you want us to understand and give us courage to apply the truth of what we're learning. We ask Lord that you would speak to us today. It's in Christ's name we pray these things, amen.
Hi, Grace Chapel. My name is Matt Rustin, and I'm the executive director at an organization called Made to Flourish. We work with churches across the country to help people try to integrate two things that can sometimes feel separate in our lives. Our daily work, whether that's paid or unpaid, and our faith in Christ. So it's a delight to be with you uh, this Labor Day weekend, a holiday that apparently has something to do with our work. Now, if you're like me, you might be a little fuzzy on the details of why we celebrate Labor Day. There's a general sense of what it's about, but it's a little bit fuzzy. Maybe if you're lucky enough to have the day off on Monday, you'll spend it with friends or grilling out. Kind of symbolically marks the end of summer. But what is Labor Day about? I mean, for a lot of holidays, we know exactly what the purpose is, right? I mean, take Christmas. We celebrate Jesus' birth, right? Or take Easter. We obviously celebrate Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Or take Halloween. We celebrate candy. Well, that's what my kids think the holiday is about, at least. But what about Labor Day? What is Labor Day all about? Well, I won't turn this entire message into a history lesson, but if you don't know or if you've forgotten, Labor Day in America dates all the way back to 1882, when it was first celebrated with a parade in New York City. You got that picture there of people in a parade and they're walking. I'm not exactly sure what they're up to. Looks like it's raining. That's kind of a bummer. But after that first parade in New York City, it would gain national adoption in just two years because in 1884, then President Grover Cleveland signed a law that Congress passed designating the first Monday in September a national holiday for workers. If you go on the Department of Labor's site, they have a little paragraph that describes what the purpose of Labor Day is. Here's what that says. It says, American labor has raised the nation's standard of living and contributed to the greatest production the world has ever known. And the labor movement has brought us closer to the realization of our traditional ideals of economic and political democracy. It is appropriate, therefore, that the nation pays tribute on Labor Day to the creator of so much of the nation's strength, freedom, and leadership, the American worker. So there it is. That's what Labor Day is all about, the American worker. Labor Day was created so that the American workers might be acknowledged and thanked and remembered. That's a good thing. But it's probably appropriate on this Labor Day to not only acknowledge the American worker, but to ask the question, how are American workers really doing? Perhaps you've seen some of the books and articles that have been coming out that suggest that actually a lot of American workers are really struggling. 
And they're struggling in at least one of two ways. First of all, for some people, they struggle because work has become everything in life. It's like the central and main source of of meaning and purpose for them. It like defines who they are. That might not at first glance appear to be a problem because people who care about their work, they, they care deeply, good things can come from that. But I'm talking about something that goes beyond that. Like when work defines like your view of your, your worth in life. And that can cause a world of hurt for the people themselves and for the people around them. Professor Carolyn Chen has written about this. She's a professor of ethnic studies at UC Berkeley and the author of Work, Pray, Code. And for her work, she interviewed a bunch of people in the tech industry. And she found that many people that she talked to were using like spiritual language, like religious language to describe their experience of work. Here's what she wrote about that in the New York Times. She said, many said that they had become more spiritual, whole, and connected after working in tech. Their workplaces were communities where they found belonging, meaning, and purpose. But as I discovered during my research, the gospel of work is thin gruel, an ethically empty solution to meet our essential need for belonging and meaning. And it is starving us as individuals and communities. And in the rest of her book, she makes the argument that that disposition is actually really harmful uh, to the human person. Or Derek Thompson in The Atlantic, he wrote an article a few years back that uh, got a lot of reads. A lot of people were sharing uh, it. And he talked about this thing called workism. It's a term he defined. It's like a new religion. You've got Hinduism, you've got Buddhism, Taoism, and then workism. Here's what he said. What is workism? It's the belief that work is not only necessary to economic production, but also the centerpiece of one's identity and life's purpose. So these different people that are writing are are looking at something that's happening in our culture, and they're saying, for a lot of people, work is everything. It's the only thing. If that falls apart, they're devastated and can scarcely recover. But there's another viewpoint that's popping up, and maybe you've seen articles or people talking about this, and it's the exact opposite. For some people, many of whom are burnt out or disillusioned at work, maybe they become frustrated or just exhausted, work should mean almost nothing in life. As if it's almost irrelevant to your life, like an unfortunate waste of 60,000 hours of your life, just down the drain. You've probably heard of terms like quiet quitting or lazy girl jobs or the good enough job. You just kind of show up and instead of quitting, you, you basically try to just fly beneath the radar and do as little as possible. Some see this as a needed rebalancing, but some are talking about it as a way to basically check out of work. There's actually a thread on Reddit uh, that is an anti-work group. And if that's you, you can just go there and kind of, you know, commiserate with people who are against work. Look, work can be extremely difficult, grueling, hard on the human soul. So some people are saying the answer to this is do as little as you can, Work is only a necessary evil. You're going to have to find something else in your life that's going to give you purpose outside of work. So we've got these two polar opposites in our culture. Work means everything, and work means nothing. Both are clues that a lot of people are struggling with their relationship with work. But what about you? I don't know if you're a person of faith or not, but how is work going for you, paid or unpaid. And by the way, whenever I say work, I'm talking about however you contribute, whether that's volunteering or caring for aging parents or kids or the place where you clock in each day. Like really, how's your work going? I want you to hold on to that question in the back of your mind today because we're going to be taking the rest of our time together to take a closer look at what the Bible says about our work what it means, how it can go wrong, 
and then what can set it right. And the Bible's teaching about work isn't reserved for like a special class of workers, like a privileged few. It has in mind all work and all kinds of workers. So to get started, I want to look at a very old passage in the Bible that might be the first example of work going very, very wrong. It happens all the way towards the beginning of the Bible in one of the first ever large-scale work projects in the Bible. Actually, it's a large construction project, a huge group of laborers. And you can read about it in Genesis chapter 11. I'll put it up on the screen so we can all look at it together. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Here's an artistic depiction of the Tower of Babel from Hendrik van Cleve III. He was a 16th century artist. And I just love how artists can take a scene and kind of give us an imagination of what it might have been like to be there. Now, many biblical commentators see the first 11 chapters of Genesis as a literary set, like this continuous downward spiral of people as they turn away from God. So chapter 11 of Genesis that we looked at right now, you would expect to see parallels from earlier on in, in Genesis chapter one. And when you take a closer look, that's exactly what you see. Note that last sentence. It expressed the purpose of them building the tower. They said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its tops in the heavens. It's insinuated that they want to kind of be like God. They actually think they are God. Back in Genesis 1, God was with Adam and Eve in the garden, dwelling among them. But this is now the people uh, saying, we want to actually go up there. We want our work to bring us transcendence. We're kind of, we're actually kind of like God. <laughs> in the ancient Near East, uh, people would build these high towers called ziggurats. And it was basically you'd go up real high and try to get closer to the gods so they could come down to you and you could worship them. But this is an ambitious project that goes far beyond that. They actually want to build a tower into the heavens. Look at how the text goes on. They say, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Let us make a name for ourselves. That's a fascinating phrase, isn't it? What do you hear when you read that? It sounds to me like the people of Babel were wanting to be known for their impressive tower, to be feared, to be respected by all the other peoples around them. That's what I hear. But I suspect the original readers would have also heard something else. Because you see, the Bible had another let us make. The original readers would have read this in the original Hebrew, na'ase, meaning let us make, and it only occurs one other time in the book of Genesis. Back in chapter 1, when God had said, let us make humankind in our own image. God first said, let us make, in Genesis 1. But now the people are saying, let us make a name for ourselves. The irony is that when God said, let us make male and female in our image, it was God conferring the highest dignity on humankind. You and me would be made in God's image, us. We didn't have to go around making images of God. He had already made an image of himself, us. And what you see all around that passage in Genesis 1 and 2 is that one of the primary ways that we image God is through our work. We show what he's like through our work. After all, God was the first worker, the ultimate creative maker who designed and built a world not only with functionality, but incredible beauty. 
and then he rested from his work. And then in Genesis 2, he called those first humans to get to work, making something out of the world that he had made. Work was God's idea. So when God said, let us make man and woman in our image, it was a statement that our work would show who God is, what his name is like. This past week, I was at a conference, and many of us commented on how amazing these chairs were that we were sitting in. They were these luxurious, just comfortable. You wanted to sit in these chairs for hours if you could. They were amazing, and they were beautiful. And at a certain point, I wondered, like, who made these chairs? So I turned one of the chairs upside down, and it had this little marking on the bottom of the chair. It said, Hanson and Sons. Now, you can imagine someone was working on those chairs, crafting them with incredible care. So it was a chair that I would enjoy. And it reflected on the name Hanson and Sons. They're known because of their workers for these incredible chairs, and their name is on it. That's a picture of what our work was supposed to be like, <laughs> that as we went about our work with incredible excellence and beauty, it actually reflect on God's name. His name would be the plate on our work that we created. Let us make. But now the author of Genesis introduces a very different let us make. The people are speaking like God, except they have a different plan. Their making is now going to be about their own name, not a reflection of who God is. In fact, it's the exact opposite of God's design for work. Isn't it fascinating that long before the modern trappings of work, trying to put your brand out there or make a name for yourself, way back then, there were people engaged in a blue-collar construction project who had turned the purpose of work into something that would promote their name. This story is as old as humankind. Ever since Babel, that has been one of our most common struggles with work. Work isn't about reflecting God's character and his provision in the world. It's about my name personally. Or it's about our organization's name. Or it's about our ministry's name. Let us make a name for ourselves. The problem is, when we do that, it either ends up crushing us or crushing others. Incredible injustice can happen when we make that the purpose of our work. A few years back, Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla, and by the way, when I bring up this example, I'm not making a statement for or against Elon Musk. I don't know what you think about him, but it's very interesting what he sent out because he was getting some flax for, for work conditions at Tesla at the time. So he sends out this tweet in what was then Twitter, and he said this, There are way easier places to work, but nobody ever changed the world on 40 hours a week. So someone asked him a follow-up question. Well, if no one changed the world on 40 hours a week, then like, what's the ideal work week? So he, he sends back this message. He says, well, it varies per person, but about 80 sustained, peaking above 100 at times. So just humor me for a second. Let's just do a little bit of math here. A regular work week, like that's the norm for all the people of 80 sustained hours. If you had a seven-day work week, so you never take a day off, it would still require 11 to 12-hour days. If you factor in like maybe a lunch break, if you get that, maybe some travel time to and from work, you're talking about the average worker waking up and leaving at 7 a.m. in the morning and getting home at maybe 8 p.m. day after day after day. And that's not even to mention the, the work weeks that are 100 hours. That's a seven-day uh, work week with 15-hour work days. So you're going to work at 7 a.m. and you're getting home at 10 p.m. day after day after day. Now, I know some of you work in industries where that's required for a little bit of time, like a medical residency or something like that, and that's just part of going through the gauntlet. But Musk here is saying that's kind of the norm for the rest of your life. That's how you make a name for yourself. I have to say, there's something deeply American sounding about that. It almost sounds heroic, like we're doing something around here. But in the Bible, 
It also sounds a lot like the story of God's people working in Egypt under the brutality of Pharaoh. Now, this is just my opinion, but I kind of feel like Pharaoh could have sent out that tweet. Can you hear the Israelites groaning, making brick day after day when they were slaves in Egypt? And Pharaoh grabs his phone and sends out the tweet. Sure, there are easier places to work than building world-class Egyptian palaces, but no one ever changed the world on 40 hours a week. And look, this isn't about picking on a particular company or CEO. It could have been a religious organization like a church or nonprofit. In fact, there have been many that have tried to protect their name while abuses went on under them that they tried to cover up lest it hurt their name. When this shift happens, when work is disconnected from God's intent, we have made work into something it was never designed to be. Now, I imagine some of us are thinking, well, that's a little bit extreme, isn't it? (laughs) I mean, I'm not even sure how preoccupied I am with work. Like, how would I know if I was making work about my name? Here are a few diagnostic questions that you can just ask yourself and And if the answer is yes, maybe there's something to explore a little bit deeper. Here are some questions you can ask. When work is going well, everything else in my life feels okay. But if I fail in my work, I'm crushed and I can't let it go. Or work is allowed to interrupt everything else in my life. The idea of ceasing from work is scary because I feel like I will lose momentum or lose ground on others. It's hard for me to feel happy about the success of others in their work because I feel like it should have been me and I'm just falling behind. And this last one, actually, sometimes work actually gives a negative identity to us. I'm ashamed of my role at work and would prefer not to mention it because it might cause people to look down on me. In this broken, fallen world, work has a way of becoming more about me and my name than representing God's provision and his care for others. This is how work becomes broken and how it breaks us. But there's a different way. And it starts by realizing that we all have multiple aspects of our identity. At different times of the day or different times of the year, we operate out of these identities. And some of them are more important than others. For instance, we have identities based on our family, For me, I'm a brother, but I'm also a son, but I'm also a husband, but I'm also a father. We have identities based on our gender and our race. We have an identity associated with our job, whether it's paid or unpaid. You might associate your identity with the city where you live or even the sports team that you root for. Now, some of these identities can be lost or changed, but some identities stay with us no matter what or where we are. And the fact that we have all these different aspects of our identity doesn't mean that we're confused. It means that we're complex. We're multifaceted with a beautiful, unique mix of identities. These are all important to our sense of self and how we live in the world. Now, imagine that we had a bike wheel and you see all the spokes coming down from all the different sides of the wheel. You can imagine that all these different spokes are like aspects of our identity. They give us a sense of who we are and they give structure to our life. But then as you look at this wheel and you imagine it, you, as you look down in the spokes, you, you see that they're all connected to a center hub. In a wheel, it's obvious that the hub is at the center. And when you look at the New Testament, it's obvious that Jesus Christ is to be the center hub of our lives. Here's just one example of a verse that demonstrates that. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus Christ and our identity of children as children of God is the only hub that can bear the weight of all these different aspects of our identity. 
our work can actually become anchored, centered on Christ instead of our own name. Every once in a while, you see this on very public display. Now, I don't know if you ever get into golf or watch any golf, like kind of aimlessly on a Sunday afternoon just to be peaceful in the background. I watch it every once in a while. I'll tune in for different big tournaments that are going on. And in the last two years, there's one name, one person who shot way to the top, at the top of the golf world. His name is Scotty Scheffler. And at least recently, he was the number one golfer in the year. He's just in his 20s, his early 20s. And his meteoric rise really began in 2022, and it was cemented when he won the Masters Golf Tournament in April of 2022. And as the final day came in this tournament and all the other golfers were caving in, Scotty Scheffler just showed this amazing poise, this calm that couldn't be, couldn't be flapped. It couldn't be shaken. And after he won the Masters Golf Tournament in 2022, of course, there's lots of interviews. There was cameras. And one interview asked him, how did you remain so poised? How did you get through it and seem so unflappable? Here's what Scotty said. He said, the reason why I play golf is because I'm trying to glorify God and all that he has done in my life. And so for me, my identity isn't a golf score. Like Meredith, his wife, told me this morning, she says, if you win this golf tournament today, or if you lose this golf tournament by 10 shots, if you never win another golf tournament again, I'm still going to love you. You're still the same person. Jesus loves you and nothing changes. In a golf tournament, the Masters, where your name is literally rising or falling based on your golf score, Scotty Scheffler said, I'm not my golf score. Now, I realize that most of us are not professional athletes working out our sense of identity in front of a live TV audience. We're nurses and we're teachers and restaurant servers and engineers and scientists and receptionists and people in sales roles. We're stay-at-home parents or retirees who have opportunities to volunteer or work without pay. But perhaps this week or later this month, there's going to be a situation that calls your very sense of identity into question and what's at the center of your life. Scotty said, I'm not my golf score. I wonder if you and I both need a statement like that in our lives. I'm not my sales goal. I'm not my grade point average. I'm not my investor pitch. I'm not my journal article. I'm not my sermon. I'm not my latest mistake and I'm not my latest success. Jesus loves me and I'm a child of God and nothing can change that. Now, the irony is that anchoring your identity, especially your work in Christ, with him as the central hub of your life, can actually make you a better worker. Now, I know that's not the reason why we would do that, but like it actually can make us better workers in the workplace. A couple examples. Over time, it will enable you to be more emotionally secure and stable at work because you can accept criticism or critique from your supervisor or from others without letting it crushing you. Because ultimately, it's not about your name. You're just trying to glorify God. So you actually welcome uh, critique and criticism if it makes you more like Christ and representing his work. It can make you more humble because you can accept praise without it letting, letting it go to your head. No one wants to work with an arrogant, self-centered person. Maybe you've been around a person like that in your work. And like, it's just no fun to be around a person like that. But if your name isn't on the line, you're set free to be humble. To let go of the constant need for self-promotion and acknowledgement. It can bring an other's first mentality in your work, which is incredibly valuable in the workplace. Because it's not about your name. 
so you can grow in self-forgetfulness, not worrying about your reputation, but set free to promote other people, even as you do your work with excellence. In fact, this issue of finding your identity in Christ can make or break your work life. The best job with a misplaced identity will destroy you. The worst job with your identity rooted in Christ can be deeply meaningful. Every job has purpose when you know who you are. Now, as I reflect on that this Labor Day, I think that's what the world is longing to see. Not merely that our faith in Christ is true in a theoretical sense, but that faith in Christ is good. Justice, grace, mercy, patience, love, empathy, joy. The main place they would encounter that is through Christ followers at work as we image our God who is just and gracious and patient and loving. The church is not the building. We are the church. Us. The church is not the brick and mortar. The church is the people of God. In the primary place we are the church is out there at your work, paid or unpaid. Your labor is not in vain. The church of Jesus Christ should be good for the world, not only on Sunday at the building, but on Monday in our work. And with Christ at the center, that's exactly what can happen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for each person that is listening today that you might help us because it's hard. We get so distracted by trying to promote our own name and we get in too deep, but we ask that by your Spirit, you might actually help us put you at the center of our lives and at the center of our work so that we wake up each day seeking to glorify you and represent you in whatever we do. We're grateful that you can actually make that change in us, so we invite you to do it right now and today. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Old things have passed away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains a cornerstone. The things that we
Well, I hope Matt's words offer to you help and perspective of how we approach the topic of work. And I hope you head into your Monday mornings feeling more spiritually confident that your work matters to God. And I also hope that you can be a blessing to those around you in all that you do. Work is a, it's a tough topic. And I know some of you are, are looking for a job or a line of work right now. Some of you are trying to retire. Some are already retired. Some of you are stay at, doing stay-at-home work, which is one of the hardest and also one of the most fulfilling types of work. Some are in the middle of their career asking all sorts of questions. So friends, if, if we can be of any help to you, please reach out to your online pastor, John, and I'm always happy to help as well. So before we go, a prayer as we go back to work, whatever that looks like for you. Lord, we thank you for all that you've entrusted us with. We thank you for, for roles and titles and careers and occupations. We thank you for the blessing of these things. But we pray, Lord, that you'd help make our path straight. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us as we manage work exhaustion and team dynamics. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us in, in the specific and unique challenges that, that we face. I lift up to you, Lord, those who are, are looking to make a change in their work life. Those who are looking for a new career or looking for a job right now, Lord, I pray that you'd provide and that you'd be with them, that you'd help grow their faith as they're in the midst of this search process. I also pray, Lord, that, that you'd be with those who, who don't have traditional forms of work, but they are working. I pray, Lord, that you'd keep them strong and healthy and protect them and may your spirit lead them. And Lord, I pray that in all the ways that we work, that we would be actively building your kingdom and honoring you and living out the way of Jesus from Sunday to Sunday. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.